Fit like Abdi, hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and Abdi else out there that's watching. My name is Pauline Cordner and I am a storyteller from the northeast of Scotland and I'm here to do another wee set for everybody at worldstorytellingcafe.com. Now before I start, I just want to draw your attention to the wee hat down below the video on the webpage where you can make um, a wee donation, put a couple of coins in the hat for whatever storyteller you're watching. And there's a whole heap of wonderful storytellers out there telling amazing stories. Now, for my first story, story today, I'm going to go a thousand years back, back to the Arabian Nights, one of my favourite, favourite story collections. Now, this is a story um, which appeals to me because I have got a history in science. Now, a long, long time ago, way, way back, in the kingdom of Fars, there was a wise man. Now, the wise man's name was Duban. He had been off on pilgrimage. He had been off on pilgrimage and then travelled beyond. He had gone to the north, the south, the east and the west. And there he had learned medicines and he had learned philosophy and all sorts of things. Eventually... Tired and dusty, he came in through the great gates of the city and he noticed that all around him, the people in the marketplace who were normally chattering and happy, looked quite sad and forlorn. But he shrugged that off and he made his way through the streets, carrying his mule, which was packed with all sorts of things that he had bought on his journey. And he made his way through the streets to the family home where he was greeted by his wife, his sons, his daughters and their family and of course all the grandchildren and it was a very, very happy time. They had feasting, there were songs, there were stories. It was a right big hooli. But as it got later on and some of the children went off to bed and some of the ladies excused themselves, Duban found himself alone with two of his oldest sons and he said to them, tell me, there's something different about the city. People seem so sad. It is not the city that I left. And the brothers looked at each other and they said, yes, father, something terrible has happened. Well, what is it? What is it that cannot be solved? The king has leprosy. Leprosy, said Duban. Yes, he has had all sorts of doctors. He has all sorts of wise, wise folk come to him, but no one has been able to cure him. The people fear he is near death. The people fear he is near death because no one has seen him. He sees no one from day to day. And it was at that point that Duban made up his mind that he would go the very next day and visit the king. And that he did. And when the king's men saw him, they said, another, another wise man? No, 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 no. We have had wise women from the east and the north, wise men from the west and the south. No one can cure the king. Stop wasting our time. This is different, said Duban. I have travelled far and wide and perhaps I bring a new cure. And he went to see the king. And the king was sitting in his quarters, wrapped almost entirely in bandages, weeping sores. He looked in so much pain and Duban examined him. And the king was quiet and patient while he did that and he allowed Duban to check his mouth, his face, the backs of his hands. His mouth was even full of sores. And he told Duban that he could not swallow medicine. It was that painful. Duban felt so sorry for the king and he thought there was nothing he could do for him and he held his hand but when he did that he turned the king's hands over and he noticed that the palms of the king's hands were as soft and as clean and as pure as a baby's bottom. Do you play polo, your majesty? Oh, I did, said the king, yes, before this illness came upon me. We shall play polo again. You will feel the vigour as you did as a young man. Now tomorrow, be on the pitch and I shall come and I shall play with you. The king thought this was very unusual, but he agreed. 
Duban went home through the marketplace and he picked up a polo stick. Now, for those of you that might be watching that don't know what a polo stick is, you can Google it or I can describe it. It's just basically a mallet with a long handle. You sit on your horse and you swing it at a wee ball. Now, Duban purchased a, a polo stick. He took it home. And when he got home, he went to some of the medicines that he still had unpacked from his arrival the day before and he got a mortal and pestle and he ground together powders and oils and smelling, pungent smelling things until eventually he had a brown paste. And he took that brown paste and he packed it around the handle and he lay the handle out in the sun to dry. And the next morning he got up, he took the handle you could tiny little hammer, tap, 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 and down fell the hardened pieces of the mixture, like tiny shrapnels of hardened clay. Duban walked to the palace. He handed the polo stick to the king and he bade the king go play. And he watched as the king used the last of his energy to, to play and play and he could see the joy returning to the king's face and he said to the king, harder, harder, right harder, play faster. And soon the king began to sweat. When he got off his horse, Devan took the stick from him and he said to the king, do not wash tonight. And the king said, but I am sweaty. I Do not, said Devan, and I will see you tomorrow for another game. He went home that night he made the same mixture, the same paste. He coated it onto the handle. He left overnight to dry. And the next morning, tap, 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 tap. He returned with the polo stick to the king. Second day, the king played. A second day, the king sweated. A second day, Duban said, do not wash tonight, my lord. Again, he took the stick. He made the paste, he packed it round the handle, he let it dry and the next morning, tap, 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 he handed the stick to the king who played and he could feel the joy and the freedom start to return to his heart but by the end of it he was exhausted and sweating and he said to Duban, what is the meaning of this? Duban said, tomorrow I will come to the baths. The next morning, the king was lured into a bath of hot water, filled with perfume, with flowers floating on top. And Duban sat at the side and he said to the king, now wash yourself, your majesty. And as the king soaked in the bath, the sores on his skin started to lift and float off, leaving behind the most beautiful, soft skin. The king almost jumped out of the bath and he stood naked in front of Duban and he said, how did you do this? What is this magic? Duban smiled and he said, I knew there was no way that I could give you medicine to swallow. I knew that none of the creams you had been putting on had had any effect. So what I did was I put the medicine onto the handle of the polo stick. Every time that you sweated, the medicine soaked into your hands and that is how you were cured. Well, the king was delighted and had Duban declared highest on high. And that night Duban was invited to dine with the king and the king sat surrounded by his family and his children and it was very merry indeed. But there was one person who was not happy and who did not rejoice. You see, there was the Grand Vizier. And quite often in a story from the Arabian Nights, you just know that a Grand Vizier is bad news. This one was called Jafar, as they quite often are. And he hated Duban. You see, the king's oldest son was still very young. Who would have been in charge? Who would have been effectively ruling? Well, it would have been Jafar. And this man, Duban, had single-handedly taken the throne away from his grasp. So he stood and he watched as the king and Duban discussed all sorts of things, poetry, music, geography, history, philosophy, the world. Later that night, when Duban had left, he went to the king and he said, Your Majesty, 
This man, how do you know that he means you good? A man who can cure you can kill you just as easily. And the king looked at him and he said, Jafar, are you crazy? This man just saved my life. But you know what it's like? If you keep hearing the same thing over and over and over from different people said in slightly different ways, but you might start to believe it. And Jafar made sure that the rumours were out there. Duban was a spy from another country. Duban had the power to kill the king. The king at first tried to ignore these rumours, but soon he started to wonder, and the wonder started to doubt, and the doubt started to become serious concern. Jafar had some evidence planted in Duban's house. And one day the soldiers went. They arrested Duban and he was brought and he was thrown in front of the king and he was shown the evidence, which of course he denied. Your Majesty, I love you. You are my king. Why? Why? Why would I try to kill you? This is not so. This is some plot, some treachery. Jafar stood behind the king and he smiled. The king said, I'm sorry. You are my friend and I love you dearly, but... The safety of the ruler of your kingdom and his family is of the utmost importance. And so it was that Duban was to be put to death. He beseeched the king, please, please, your majesty. I have so much at home to, to organise. I wish to say goodbye to my family. The king sighed deeply. It would be too much of a risk, he said. But no, said Duban, no, listen to me. There is something I have, something, something I brought back from my travels. I, I, I cannot think who else I could trust it with. You are the man in the world who I trust the most, even though you feel you must have me put to death. What is this thing that you have, said the king? Can we go somewhere quiet, said Duban, somewhere I may talk to you? The king nodded and followed by a guard, he made his way down, down, down into the depths of the palace where a room down in the dungeons was opened and the king and Duban went in alone. It was not decorated. It was not a place of punishment, just a quiet room where people could talk in secret. They sat on some cushions on the floor, but of course they were not alone. The king had his most trusted advisor, just on a grill on the other side of the wall, and Duban and the king were overheard by Jafar himself. Your Majesty, the greatest of all magics came into my hands on my journeys. I trust no one but you. The greatest of all magic, what are you talking about, said the king. The genie, he said. The king said, but those are just in stories, surely. No, no. I found the means to create a genie at home. I have a book that contains the spell. It contains the incantations, the magic words to turn someone into a genie. If this was to fall into the wrong hands, your majesty, your kingdom could be destroyed, not just your life. The king frowned, he said, and you would give this to me? Yes, said Duban. What you must do is you must take the objects that I will give you. A silver plate, a bag of sand and the book. I will bring them to you and when I am executed, you will take my head and while the blood still pours from my neck, from my wounds, you must place my head onto the silver plate on which has been poured the sand. And then you must take the head on the sand, on the plate, and keep it somewhere safe with the book. And only, only when there is absolute desperation and you can think of no other way out for your country, may you then turn me into your most honourable and humble servant. I will rise as a terrifying, all-powerful creature, and I will save your kingdom. But please tell no one of this. 
king agreed. And so that night, Duban went home and he set things in order. He said goodbye to his family, to his sons, his daughters, his grandchildren and his wife. And the next morning, at first light, Duban was brought to the king, carrying a sack which contained the big platter, a leather-bound book with vellum pages, and a small bag of sand. Without further ado, Duban's head was very quickly removed from his shoulders with the swift slice of a sword. Smiling grimly, Jafar took the head and following the king's instructions down in that room, he poured out the sand onto the plate and he placed the head and the sand soaked up the blood. The book was laid next to the head on the sand on the plate and the room was locked and the key was hung around the king's neck. And that was the end of Duban. The story doesn't end there. The, the time passed and time passed. And eventually Jafar saw that he was getting no closer to power. And he decided that it was time for a little intervention. One night he slipped a sleeping draught into the king's drink. And the king slept soundly that night and Jafar crept into the room and removed the key. He went downstairs, he unlocked the room. Within the room, with a lantern, he looked at the shriveled head of Duban upon the plate on the sand and he brought out the book. It was thick and it was heavy and he remembered the instructions that he had heard. Turn to the end of the writing, the last page. This is about halfway through the book, Duban had told the king before he was executed. And there you will find the words. So he started to turn the pages. But the pages were old and the pages were crumbling and they would not turn easily. So he turned the page and there was some writing. It looked like poetry. But the next pages were stuck together too. The book was so old. And he turned the page. More poetry. Philosophy. The next page was turned. And he had to admire that the handwriting was beautiful and the illustrations more so. But this did not look like it would contain incantations. But then sometimes... Magic can be held in the most mundane of places, so he kept turning the pages. It was so old. He feared that as he licked his fingers and turned the pages that they would crumble. But they did not. And he turned through page after page of poetry. And then he came to the place where the writing stopped. But here was a blank page. This did not look like incantations. This was just poetry about trees and spring. He turned the pages back and forth, back and forth. He thought maybe there is some way of bringing up hidden writing. He held it up to the light, up to the, the glint, the light from the lantern, but nothing. He was confused. And then he started to feel somewhat hot and dizzy and all of a sudden there was a pain in his stomach and he 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 groaned he collapsed to the ground his breathing grew shallower and shallower rasping as Duban lay on the floor and died the next morning the king discovered the key missing and he went down the stairs into the room and there he found Jafar lying dead on the floor and he realised that his friend had been true to him all along 
because there are, is no such thing as genies. What there was was a very clever man called Duban, who had taken that book the night before his execution and who had painted each and every page with a deadly poison. Attaching, sticking the pages together, he knew that Duban was behind this. Uh, he knew that Jafar was behind this and that Jafar would have to lick his fingers to turn the pages, each time taking a little bit of poison into his mouth. And so from beyond the grave, Duban got his revenge. <clears throat> Cold blows the wind are my true love. I am softly falls the rain. I never had but one true love, and in Greenwood he lies slain, and I'll do as much for my true love as any young girl may. I'll sit and weep down by his grave for twelve months and one day. Well, when twelve months were past and gone, this young man he rose. Why do you weep down by my side? I can't take my repose. Oh, one kiss, one kiss, oh, your lily white lips. One kiss is all I crave. One kiss, one kiss, oh, your lily white lips. And return back to your grave. My lips, they are as cold as clay, and my breath is heavy and strong. If you were to kiss these cold clay lips, then your days would no be long. Oh, is there any room, love, by your head? Is there any at your feet Is there any room down by your side Where that I may sleep No, there is no room up by my heart No, nor any room at my feet There is no room down by my side for my coffin's made to need. Cold blows the wind are my true love. I am softly falls the rain. I never had but one true It's a wee song called The Unquiet Grave, which leads me nicely into my next story. Now, excuse me, I'm just going to have a wee drink of water. That's better. Now, um, this is a story from the northeast of Scotland. I'm sure there are other versions across the world, but this is our local version. Um, a few miles from Aberdeen, off to the west, there is the town of Inveruri. Now, Inveruri um, has an old graveyard and a new graveyard. And in the old graveyard, there's the old um, hummock, big grassy bump um, on which there used to be a castle. Now, 
at the base of that you will find somewhere some carved Pictish stones and also the grave of a rather special lady. For many, many years ago, a wawa heine back, before science, before industrial technology came to this part of the northeast of Scotland, there was a young lady whose name was Mary Elphinstone. Now, those of you that have visited Aberdeen might have heard of Bishop Elphinstone. He founded the university. Out by Inverurie, there's another town called Port Elphinstone. Today they are merged. And Elphinstone shows to me that she was rather high class. Now, because the family were quite rich, they would always get to sit up at the front in the kirk, in the church. And that was where one day Mary, Mary who had been proposed to by many eligible gentlemen, saw someone who made her heart beat a little bit faster. Johnny was the new minister. He'd just finished his training down in Edinburgh and he was ever so nervous about doing his first sermon. And with the old minister looking on, he stood at the front, he looked at his congregation, he took a deep breath and then he saw Mary too. And his heart started to beat because to him she was the most beautiful thing in the world. And he, 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 he made a complete mess of a sermon <laughs> and afterwards he was introduced to Mary and to cut a long story short they started courting and within the year they were married and I'm going to ruin this lovely romantic tale for you because not long after their marriage Mary became very sick and one day she took to her bed and she didn't arise again and eventually with Johnny holding onto her hand one night, she just slipped away. Well, he was so distraught by her death that obviously he couldn't do the ceremony and one of his friends from college came up to do it. And even worse than that, he was so upset that after the funeral, he did two things that ministers never do. Well, they didn't in those days. Number one, he locked the doors to the manse where they lived. And number two, he took a bottle of whiskey, pulled out the cork and threw the cork in the fire, meaning that he was going to finish that bottle that night. Well, Abdi went off to the pub to celebrate Mary's life, to talk about her. Oh, they said, oh, she was our Bonnie. Oh, did you hear that Bonnie singing voice that she had? Oh, Kenneth, Head and Johnny, they would have had the most beautiful, talented, clever babies. And it's nae to be now. Let's raise a drink to Mary. I said one. But did you hear Johnny? I heard he's locked himself into the manse and that he's, he's, uh, he's nae doing something else. Well, if it was that, said the people. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this story was set just before the 1831 Medical Act. You see, the actions of Burke and Hare in Edinburgh, who were not grave robbers, they were murderers. They went out and killed people to provide bodies for medical research. They ha That brought in the Medical Act of 1831, but prior to that, Bodies were free game. Yes, there were grave robbers. Yes, there were murderers providing bodies to the doctors. Now, in Aberdeen, we had a number of anatomy schools. So all of the, the villages and towns around, they, they fell prey to the grave robbers, the resurrection men, as they were also known. Some of the... Um, some of the graveyards round about, you can still see mort houses like Bankery and Udney. You can also see mort safes, great big heavy iron cages placed up on top of the graves by six or seven men, uh, like in Sochen or Clooney uh, graveyards. But the most effective thing uh, to safeguard the body of your loved one was to have somebody watch over the grave until... How do I put this delicately? The body was no longer in a fit state to be used for medical research. But Johnny was so distraught that he hadn't sorted somebody out to do this. And that was what people were gossiping, gossiping about in the pub that night of her wake. Unfortunately, there was two wee guys in the corner of the pub, shady characters, heads bowed, 
History doesn't tell us their names, but I like to think they were Jimmy and Jimmy. Because most folk in Scotland are called Jimmy anyway, as you all know. And they overheard this, that nobody was looking after their body. And so they drank their drinks, they winked at each other, they put the empty glasses down, they pulled their hats down over their head and out they went. Out they went and they went to their cart. Now these guys weren't habitual grave robbers, just opportunists. And they knew that they could get 10 whole pounds for her body in Aberdeen at one of the anatomy schools. So they wrapped the hooves of their horse with cloth and the wheels of the cart and silently they made their way through the streets to the graveyard, found the newly dug grave and they started to dig up Mary's body in the coffin. They cracked open the coffin by this point, it was the middle of the night, the moon was shining bright and it lit up Mary lying in her coffin, buried in the same dress she'd worn on her wedding day and she was so beautiful. The dark brown ringlets curling round her face. And for a moment they stopped and respectfully put their hands on their hearts and closed their eyes. She was so beautiful. But that wasn't the only thing they noticed. You see, on her finger, along with her wedding ring, was the Elphinstone ruby. And they knew that if they could sell her body for £10 in Aberdeen, well, that ruby ring could go for 20 more. So they grabbed her finger and they pulled and they pulled and they pulled, but the ring wouldn't come off. Had on away, says wee Jimmy. And he jumped off over the wall, came back with a little hacksaw. And with that, he started to cut Mary's finger off. Well, the doctors wouldn't notice it, would they? Unfortunately for wee Jimmy and big Jimmy, very fortunately for Mary in some sort of weird kind of way, she wasn't actually dead. She'd merely slipped into a coma. And this whole time her body had been repairing itself. Her heartbeat was so shallow that it wasn't detectable. Likewise, her breathing. But this pain was enough to wake her. And she slowly came to, and in the darkness, she smelt the dark, damp fustiness of the leaf mould around her. She opened her eyes and she could see the moon, but she could see these two shadows over her. She felt the pain in her finger and all of a sudden she screamed so loudly that immediately the two Men looked at each other and they thought that she had come back from the grave to haunt them. And they leapt up and they ran and they jumped over the wall, out of the graveyard, out of Inverurie and out of the story. And there was Mary lying in her grave in her wedding dress, barefoot and confused. And what was she doing there? And where was Johnny? And she got up and she stumbled home through the streets of Inverurie, barely noticing the party that was going on in the pub, her own wake. And she made her way to the manse and she knocked on the door. And there was Johnny by the fire, drunk in his memories of Mary. And he said to himself, Faz that chapping at the door, ging awa, ging awa. But the knocking continued and eventually he said to himself, Kenneth, if I hadn't buried my dear Mary the day, I would have thought that that was her chapping at the door. And eventually he got up and he opened the door and there she was, white face stretched out towards him. Oh, my Johnny, I've come back to you. And saints alive, he fainted there and then, thinking that this was her spirit. And when he came round, she had his head cradled in her lap and she was caring for him. And ladies and gentlemen, the two of them lived happily together for many years after that until their old age. They had many children, many grandchildren. There's Elphinston still live in the area to this day. And you know something? When they both died, it was in a few days of each other, they said that they couldn't be parted. Well, they were buried, 
back in the same grave. And some folks say that uh, if you put your ear to that grave and the time is right, you might hear knocking. And that's the story of Mary Elphinstone. Now, I've got one wee last story to tell for you. Um, this is a story that Stanley Robertson told me. It, it's not his usual kind of story. Um, Stanley was a traveller that was from the northeast of Scotland, Scottish traveller, and I was lucky to learn a lot of ballads and stories of him. And um, one night before I did my first festival, which is where I ultimately met John Rowe and a whole heap of other storytellers that are taking part in the World Storytelling Cafe. Um, I spoke to Stanley because um, I needed to know a detail of a story and I was a wee bit nervous about performing in front of a festival crowd because they're a lot more rowdy than you lot at times. And he said, dinner worry, dinner worry lass, just you look into their hearts and into their eyes and you will find a story just for them. And this is a story that he told me to tell at uh, the festivals if I had the right audience. And I've got a feeling you might be the right audience. So, a wah wah heiny back. About the 1890s in Shetland, there was a laddie and his name was Sandy. Now, Sandy met Betsy at the local dance on his tiny wee island. Because you see, the Shetlands are made up of lots and lots of islands. There's the biggie bit, which is, I think it's called the mainland. That's where, um, that's where Lerwick is. But he was on this tiny wee island and people would keep a little bit of ground, a little bit of ground behind their house where they would grow vegetables and keep chickens and beasts, animals. And um, maybe somebody in the family would have a fishing boat and that was how they got by. Anyway, back in those days, people hardly ever went um, off to the other islands and uh, they basically met a very small amount of people um, with, with whom they could marry and it was so lucky that out of everybody at the dance that night Betsy was the only one he wasn't related to. Anyway the two of them fell in love, they got married and they had three beautiful children. Now the first thing to happen to them was that the First World War came. They had three bonny sons and every single boy went off and every single boy fought in the World War. One of them came back injured, he would never walk again, but they were just glad to have them back and they thought that they were so fortunate. Time passed and there was another war. Now, a couple of the younger loons went off and they had all sorts of adventures. And um, as a lot of people in uh, a lot of people watching will know, after the war came rationing. Now, things were a little bit different up in the Shetland Isles because, like I've said to you, they were they were quite self-sufficient. They had their patch of ground, they grew vegetables, they had um, some animals to provide them with milk, cheese, butter, eggs, all the rest of it. Things weren't so bad. But um, it was a Tuesday night and Sandy kissed Betsy on the forehead. He said, the morning, my dear, he said, it's going to be your birthday. You'll be 70 years old and every day that I have spent with you has enriched my life and made me so happy and he said I'll make you breakfast in bed the morning and he woke up that morning the next day the Wednesday morning a day in spring and he got up and he got her an egg and he got her some bacon and he made her some toast and some porridge and he got a wee glass of milk and he put it on a tray and he thought no there's something missing and he went off and he got this little crystal glass and he went outside and he hunted for bluebells because that was her favourite flowers. And he put them in the glass and he took it to her and he rested it down next to her bed. And he said, Betsy, wake up, birthday girl. But Betsy was never moving because Betsy had passed away with a wee smile on her face. And Sandy was sad. He was our sad. And the wake was held and the sons came with other family. They all still obeyed in the Shetland Isles, one of them uh, obeyed in the mainland. And they came back and they said, well, Dad, 
you and mum. What about all these holidays that you've had planned? Oh no, I'm not thinking of that. I wouldn't be the same without her. I wouldn't be the same. Oh, Dad, come on. All that money that you saved up, Mum would have wanted you to gang awa. I can, I can, it's our soon to be talking about it. But, give it time. Gang awa and travel the world. Go on holiday somewhere. It's the 1950s, he said. Well, time passed, a year passed, and on the anniversary of her birthday and of her death, all the family got together and the sons were, in, and the daughters in law. What if they're finding out, are you going away on holiday, Dad? Spend some of that money, go travel like you and Mum always wanted to. No, no, he said, no, no, lads, no. Another year passed and another, and it was five years since she'd died. And Sandy was 73 now, and he got up the day, and he decided he was going to go and visit her grave, as he, I did, every week. And because it was her birthday, he picked some bluebells, and he was carrying them down the road. And he bent down and he said, Well, Betsy, here I am again. Put down the floors. And then he heard a noise. Now this noise was the horn for the ferry that had just come in about. And he looked up. And he normally didn't notice the ferry. Because like I said, he never left the island. He'd, he'd been there his whole life. But the ferry wasn't at his normal time and he looked up and he looked at the grave and he looked at the ferry and he said Are you sending me a sign, Betsy? Right. And he straightened himself up, put his heart in his head and he walked down the hill to the wee harbour and he got on the ferry and he went all the way across to the mainland. Here he was in Lerwick. He looked at other big buildings. Some of them had two stories. And he found a pub. And he went in and he had half a pint. And that was fine. And he had a look to see what else there was. And here was a co-op. Now, in the those days, in fact, they still do. The co-ops provide funeral services, your groceries, the post office, and also maybe a travel agent. And so he went in the travel agent. And he saw the young lassie there. And he had his pension book with him, his post office book. Meanwhile, everybody back at home was going absolutely up the wall. They couldn't have found him anywhere. So when the second ferry of the day came in at five o'clock and he sauntered up the beach, having had another pint on the mainland, Dad, where have you been? We've been out looking for you. We've been along the beach. Mum died five years ago. We didn't have care for what you'd done with yourself. Oh, I'm fine, he said. I went to the mainland. You went to the mainland? What for? Well, I thought it was about time. And what did you do in the mainland, Feather? Well, um, I went and booked a holiday. Now, the two brothers and the two sisters-in-law gathered round. You booked a holiday, Dad? Aye, aye. Oh, that's amazing! We've been on at you for years! What made you change your mind? Betsy said, oh, oh Dad, so where are you going? Are you going somewhere exotic? Aye, aye. Are you going somewhere with really queer folk that speak in a strange way? Aye, aye. And, and is there like exotic beasts and strange birds and... Aye, I think there is. So where are you going? Are you going to Rome to see the Colosseum? Oh, no, 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 no. For about, uh, for about Egypt to see the pyramids. No, no, no. Paris? Gone to Paris? Oh, King of Huawei is. No, no, no. Well, where are you going with these folk that spit queer and the exotic an animals and birds? Where are you going? Aberdeen, he said. Well, a few weeks passed and the whole family was there in Lerwick to see him off. And uh, he had his little, little suitcase the kind that's made out of that sort of cardboardy kind of material and in there was his toothbrush and his toothpaste and his spare flat cap and a couple of changes of underwear and his pyjamas and off he went and he stood and he waved until he couldn't even see the coastline anymore and then he went away to his bed and the next morning he woke up, it was six o'clock and here he was in Aberdeen, the granite city. Now some people call my city grey but when the sun shines like it is today, it sparkles like silver and diamonds. And that was what Sandy first saw when he got off the ferry. 
And he looked around and here were buildings, three stories, four stories, five stories high. And he got off and he walked around the harbour and oh, there was all these young lasses saying hello to him. And he thought, this is a right friendly place. He went to his bed and breakfast, to his guest house, and they, they greeted him, even though he was there guy early. And they showed him to his room and he set everything out, his toothbrush and his shaving kit and his toothpaste. And he, he hung his stuff up in his wardrobe and put his pyjamas under his pillow. And he decided he was going to go out and he was going to explore Aberdeen. Where should he go first? Fitty. Fitty, the wee fishing village down by the, down by the beach. No, no, no. The golden sand. No, the, the the big granite mile Union Street that goes from one end to the other. No, no, the, the Duffy Park, Duffy Park, Hazelhead Park. You could maybe take a bus out to see the Queen at Ballatar. You didn't again. But then, he noticed something that they didn't hay back home. They had a shop. It was like Aberdeen's first supermarket. And he went in and he looked and here were all these long aisles rather than a counter with a little man in behind. And he went up to the lassie that was serving. And he said, excuse me, Quine, what is this? Get a basket, she said. Go and bring stuff and I'll ring it up and you can pay for it. And she went back to reading the woman's own and dreaming of the day her prince would come and save her from all of this. Now, off he went into the aisles. And uh, after a couple of minutes, he came back with this box and he said, Mandy, what's this? He said, well, Sandy, she said, because they'd introduced themselves earlier. That is powdered eggs. What? He said, powdered eggs. We had them during the war. There wasn't any fresh eggs. You would just put in a wee sup of this, a wee sup of that, hot water, stir it all up. Bob's your uncle, ready to make scrambled eggs. None of this can out in the cold and getting attacked by the chicken. Oh, my Betsy would have been fair chuffed with that. Oh, we had plenty during the war, but this, this is great technology. And he popped it in his basket. And off he goes and she hears him much and he comes back and this time he's got another container. Fits this, Mandy, he says. Oh, that, she says, powdered milk. What? Powdered milk. Same as before. A wee bowl. Couple of spoons, hot water, stir it up, milk. Bob's your uncle. My goodness, he says. Modern technology. God, none of this going out and milking the coo and getting the bucket kicked over and... Betsy would have loved this. Kenneth, what a wonderful world we live in. We are this technology. Wonderful, Mandy. The modern world, Mandy. Things are best done the modern way. And in goes the powdered milk to show the lads back home. Off he goes again, comes back, third box. Now Mandy, fit is this with this queer metal craters on it? Oh, so she said, powdered potatoes, she said, Sandy. Smash, they call it. And how does that work? It's not that different, Sandy, she says. Couple of wee spoons, hit water, mash up, mash potatoes. Chopping away at the hard grun to get your tatties, boiling them up, mashing them for hours. Oh my goodness, he said, Mandy, what a modern world we live in. Things are best done the modern way. Just, I can't imagine what my wife Betsy would have thought of this. Off oh, he goes in the aisles again, picking up bananas, picking up cans of stuff. And then he came back to Mandy for a fourth time with a frown on his face. <clears throat> Mandy, he says, fits this. And he puts a tin down on the counter. Well, she says, that's baby pooder. Baby pooder? Baby pooder, he said. Mandy, some things are best in the old fashioned way. And he walked out of the shop, leaving Mandy holding some tankum powder with a very funny, puzzled expression. And that was the story of Sandy's trip to Aberdeen. <laughs> I really hope you liked my stories today, folks. Um, there are so many more storytellers and so many more stories on worldstorytellingcafe.com. Don't forget, you can pop your money in the hat down below for all of the storytellers. Each and every storyteller has one. And I hope to see you back here sometime again soon. Ta-ta! Well, you've listened to the stories. 
if you're not on the web page worldstorytellingcafe.com go there now because there you have the opportunity to drop a few coins into the storyteller's hat or maybe a note or two if you don't mind you can write us a check if you want we accept anything you just click on the little hat and then you can pay us whatever you want if you don't have to if you've got no money and a lot of us haven't, don't worry. But if you've got money, we'd really appreciate it. We love to eat. But what we really appreciate is you listening to the stories. Thank you very much for listening.